Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas Podcast, where attitude is everything. On today's show, I've been jumping up and down. I, ju- I called my brother. I texted my brother. I uh, talked with my wife this morning and was just over the moon about this man and getting a chance to be able to spend time with him because there's very few people for me, if, if you know me, and you listen to the show, you've heard about my pop, you've heard about my mom, you've heard about my big brothers, you've heard about my buddies, my, my core group of friends I've been hanging with since I was in fourth grade. Um, so I have, a, I have this foundation of people, and this is one of those people where uh, very few times in your life you have people who impact you on such a, uh, such a level that, that really uh, uh, helps you throughout every aspect of your life. And today I get a chance to be able to spend time with a man who believed in me before anyone, uh, before he was supposed to, um, gave me a shot, and also spoke life into me in, in a couple of, uh, you know, um, comments that he made, which I don't even know if he realizes the impact that those had on me. Um, but it's, it's my honor, my absolute honor. He, he just calls himself Mike. But to me, he's an absolute legend. Uh, he, he is way before his time. Um, photographer, entrepreneur, and again, uh, in the professional beauty space, um, years and years and years ago, he set the tone, and we're going to talk about that later, but he set the tone for every single thing that every person that's doing uh, uh, successful in the professional beauty industry, this man set the tone for that years and years and years ago. He's a, a phenomenal photographer all over the world, and I want to uh, welcome to the show Mr. Michael Allen. Hello, hello. Mike, before we get going, I told you that I was going to uh, mention the sponsors because I want to I want to uh, pay homage and respect to them. Uh, the first thing, if you haven't got the book, the Success Leaves Clues, it's right above Michael's head that you guys could see it there. Um, it's an audio book. It's an unconventional audio book. I study successful people like Mike uh, all over the world, and what I found is they all have seven traits. Uh, I uh, unleashed the seven traits in the audio book, and it's like a, a a conversation with the author, who the author happened to be me. So you get to sit down and we get to chat for about three four hours, which was amazing. Success leaves clues. The the other ones are uh, Finley Volvo of Las Vegas. Um, this guy, Jim DiGiulio, one of the owners of that company, he has been a friend of mine and has been uh, one of the one of the best in the service industry that you could ever imagine. Samaritan's Feet. Um, this man, Manny Ahomey, this guy is, he blows me away. He's put uh, shoes on over 10 million people around the world because he grew up without shoes. He's making a difference in this world, which I think is amazing. Pink Cans for Cancer on the uh, East Coast. Uh, my man out there is uh, helping people to collect uh, cans and recycle to be able to help uh, the, uh, the cancer movement, which I think is great. Uh, probably my favorite sponsor of all time is Cardenas Law Group. Uh, boutique level law group and this honestly if you want to have service on a different level uh cardenas law group is your uh, is is the place squeeze dried is the last one that i'm going to tell you about um which squeeze dried really changed my life because it's a little stick that you could get all your uh, vegetable fruit all those things and your nutrients and all you have to do is dump it in a little bit of water if you're a simpleton like me it makes things so much easier so now to the real star of the show, which is Mr. Mike Allen, and uh, where I want to go to, you're, you're residing in Memphis, Tennessee, which we were talking about the Warriors and the, uh, and the Grizzlies. Um, we were just talking about that. But I want to I go back a little bit, Mike, because I was saying that you're a pioneer. And I was saying to one of my friends, in 1995, when I started working with you, you had touchscreen computers. Yep. that check people in, that check people out. There's most businesses right now don't have touchscreen computers. You had touchscreen computers. You had 42 hairdressers on staff at one point in one location doing right. over a million dollars in revenue in 1995. You were doing photo shoots before photo shoots were what they are today. So all you Instagrammers, TikTokers, Facebookers, all those things, this man laid the foundation for all those things in the professional beauty industry. How, Mike, were you able to see into the future like you did at that time? Uh, Kelly, I don't know, man. It's just like uh, you, you start a business and you got to do everything you can to promote yourself and promote your staff uh, and get the word out there. And back then, we didn't have internet and websites. We had the yellow pages. That was about it, a phone. Uh, reputation was it. So. I had this vision in my mind for my business to use photography and use image, images and use the talents of the hairstylists that we have working with us to create hairstyles that we photographed and sent out to inspire the world with those images. 
So it was just a part of my DNA. I guess when I was a kid, I picked up a camera and, uh, you know, took pictures of everything I could find. Uh, so all along the years in business, uh, once we started the salon business, I was like, this is a, a perfect match for what I love doing. Well, Mike, also too, the cool thing was, is you were the first person that I ever saw that wasn't a hairdresser that owned a salon because most of the time, uh, hairdressers get mad at their, their current situation. Then they grab a couple of ki- people in the back room. You know how it goes. You're smiling right now because you know exactly how it goes. They get mad in the back room. Then they're like, we're going to go do it better. And then they take their friend down the street and the one becomes the owner. And then that friend starts hating the owner because they're the owner. And they think that something's going to happen and it just keeps happening. You did it different. You created a culture in 1995 before culture was a, a word. And when I say 1995, I came along at that time, but you were you already were steeped in that culture. Like you walked in, it was completely different. You had hairdressers that, you know, for the it was the first time I ever saw hairdressers make money. It was the first time that I saw them start thinking outside of I'm going to do this person's hair behind the chair. And again, you were adding that that the almost a multimedia beforehand. Who was some of the um, mentors for you, you know, growing up in business when you were talking about the business aspect? Well, in, in the salon business, uh, you know, there was, of course, uh, Van Council. He was, he was big in, in my life. Um, all the teams, at Aveda, which is, uh, can we mention Aveda? We... Of course. Yeah, you can mention anything you want, man. I mean, we're, we are free as a bird, baby. But, you know, we start off with Paul Mitchell and KMS and Joyco and lots of other brands. Uh, but through the beauty industry, the, the more I got involved in the business, uh, I went out and studied. I went to, you know, hair shows and education myself to learn how to be a good business owner and a good mentor for my staff. So, you know, I picked up books and read books, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, the, the book I wish I could have read back when you, when you were there in the, in the 90s was uh, Dave Ramsey. I don't think he even had a book back then, but <laughs> a book when I started the business, cause I would have think, done things a little differently financially, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, but, but help, help me too with this, because again, like I think that you're, a uh, uh, such an early adopter and me and my wife were talking about this the other day that a lot of times early adopters don't get as much of the spoils. Um, you know, because sometimes you're first to market, right? And with this culture thing, what I was bragging about you actually this morning, I said, you paid us to come to advanced education that you paid the educator to come to. Can you talk to that aspect? Because that is not a normal practice. Yeah, to me, I wanted my staff to learn from the best. Uh, We brought in uh, from Van Michael Salon, uh, we brought in some of their trainers from Atlanta all the way to Memphis, flew them in, put them up. And they came and taught, you know, our staff uh, advanced hair cutting and hairstyling techniques and hair color. Uh, so to me, education was important to, because most of the education you go to, you go to a hair show and you sit in a chair and you watch something for a little bit, but you don't get that hands-on. So we, you know, we had hands-on classes in our salon from some of the top stylists in the world. Uh, and that made a big difference. Our, our, our staff loved it because they learned cool techniques. But you know who loved it the most was the clients. The clients were just blown away. Like they're bringing in educators from Atlanta and New York to, to teach, you know, my stylists how to do things. It, it created this, this little synergy uh, along with the photography. We submitted to magazines and had, you know, ads in Elle Magazine and Town and & Country and you just a host of other magazines with our work. In a small town, Memphis, back then, it wasn't, too well known like it is today, but that created this this whole synergy in the salon, and it, I mean we're booming. You mentioned earlier, you know we were one of the top two hundred salons in America, won that award many years. Uh, it was just a big big business, uh, very successful and a lot of fun. So you talked a little bit about Dave Ramsey, and you were saying, I mean I think all of us in business, right? When we do a business. We look back and we're like, damn, like, what if I could have done X, right? So yeah. can you can you help us with that? Can you uh, expand on that a little bit? Because I think a lot of times um, when I when I say this 
too, Mike, you know, for me, this was, this was never a hairdresser podcast. Although I like, I love hairdressers out there. I love them. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to show every single person in the world that it was the attitude that you took into something that, that made all the difference. And you had that attitude as far as like, it, it wasn't an option for us to do a photo shoot. It wasn't like you had this strong, uh, you know, iron fist saying, we're doing the X. But, and I know you're a super humble guy, but help me to understand, like, I want to go back to it. You, you paid us to come to education that you paid for. Like, that was one of the, that was probably one of the craziest things that I experienced at the time because I think I was 19 years old and you handed me an a, a, a envelope and the envelope at the time had cash in it. And you said, thank you so much for coming to the class. Why was that so important to you to make sure that people were paid to get education, which they should be paying for in the first place? To me, it was just vital that they got some kind of compensation because a lot of hairstylists uh, are required to go to education or go to a meeting or do this or that, and they're forced to do it, and they don't really want to. Uh, so to me, paying them just a, it wasn't a huge amount. I mean, it may have been 20, 25 bucks or 10 bucks. I don't know what it was back then, but it was something. And to me, it was, it was me acknowledging my acknowledgement to them and as our staff, uh, that they were important to me and it was important that they took their day off to come in and learn something else and learn something new. I just wanted them to be compensated for it. So that was my mindset is, you know, I didn't want to go places and not get, you know, and go to work and not get paid. And that basically you're going to work even though you're getting education. Uh, so it was, to me, it was just an, another perk I could give my staff that I knew I could afford to do and it helped, helped me grow the business, help, help uh, bring in more clients and it just made everything work. Now, looking back in hindsight, uh, Mike, when you, when you were talking about the Dave Ramsey part of it, um, my dad had always said something that didn't click until I actually was further on into uh, entrepreneurship and, and owning businesses, which was it wasn't about the money you made, it was about the money you keep. Um, can, can you talk to that a little bit? Because I think that every entrepreneur, like a true entrepreneurs, like, you know, they, they have gone, we learn that later on. We don't learn that up front. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I learned in business is, you know, we, I didn't always keep every dime that I made. I reinvested that back in the company for many, many years. I, mean, I just kept putting that money back in, back in at my own personal sacrifice. And there, there was years I did extremely well. There was years I just squeezed by. Um, but to me, uh, that's where I wish I could have had a little more Dave Ramsey training back in those days because I would have put a little more aside in a you know nest egg for the future, so to speak. But uh, any businessman, I've seen businesses you walk in and they um, they build a new business and then they don't put anything back into it. So they're good at first and you're excited and you go back a couple years later and the place is starting to look run down. Uh, the staff doesn't have the same attitude. So to me, reinvesting, uh, a good example is the restaurant industry. Uh, if you go to a really good restaurant, uh, if they move a chain or a big restaurant into the, the city you're in, uh, that restaurant usually does well for the first several years. And then something happens. Restaurants just kind of slowly, I guess, don't do well. And then they end up uh, selling or closing or uh, becoming another name and trying to reinvent themselves. But the ones that were successful kept their interiors clean, modern. Uh, they would reinvest their money into redesigning the restaurant. It's one of my favorite shows, you know, Restaurant Impossible. You know, the guy comes in there and says, look, this place is a train wreck. It's a mess. It's filthy. Uh, so to me, that was part of the salon world is I want my, my clients to come in, the customers of the salon come in and have this Disney World experience when they walked into the salon. Because back in the day when I had a salon, hair salons weren't very pretty. They were just kind of an ugly little building with pink chairs and uh, gold wallpaper and just, just weird looking stuff. Uh, to me, I had kind of this construction contractor interior designer kind of mindset, part of my visualization of photography too, that I wanted clients to come in and have an experience, not just with their stylist, but coming into the building and going, wow, look at this place. This is this is neat. I feel great. I feel like I'm taking a little mini vacation and I'm paying this guy to get my hair cut. So, 
anyway, I probably spent, sorry, Dave Ramsey, I probably spent a little too much money redesigning. Uh, but over the years, we were in business 20, 25 years. So every four or five years, we'd do a makeover. Yeah. And I've heard, you know, Van Council say the same thing. They'll shut their salon down and gut it to the floors uh, and, and reinvent it and redesign it just to keep it fresh and uh, successful. Did I answer the question there? I'm Absolutely. And, and to paint a picture for all of you out there, whether you're watching and you're seeing Mike Allen that has not aged since I saw since I moved away from Memphis in 1997. Um, lost a little hair. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> but if you're, li if you're listening, I want to paint the picture for you. If, you're, if you could see me, you could see my hands moving and things like that. But I want you to understand that, like, when I got into the professional beauty industry, I remember I worked at another salon in Memphis. And I told them all, I said, I dream of someday. And this is what, you know, I was standing at 19 years old. I was so excited to just be and have a job. And all the people that were there, they were like, oh, I got a job, whatever. And they were like, calm down. You don't need to be so excited. And I remember saying, someday I'm going to change every single guest into a robe before they get their hair done. Because we didn't at, our, at the salon that I worked at. We just put a cape on them. And then I said, yeah. and someday, because I used to have to uh, get, like, if they wanted a drink, then I would ask them for 75 cents. And I would go back to the Coke machine, buy them a Coke, bring it back to the station and set it up. And I said, someday, all the Cokes are going to be complimentary. And yep. when I said this, I didn't know what a ston was. And I remember I got the, 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 uh, the advice to go and see what your salon was. And I deliberately dressed down. I don't know if I ever told you this, Michael. But I deliberately dressed down. I wore jeans and just a white T-shirt because I didn't even want the job because I was happy at the other place, whatever it was. And then I remember pulling up. And what you're talking about, that experience, I about, I crawled into the smallest little hole because I saw this. I mean, I saw the pillars. I saw the huge windows out front. I saw this hustle and bustle. I saw 42 hairdressers. I saw a makeup station. I saw frosted glass before that was a thing. I saw touchscreen computers. I saw the robes of every single guest. I saw a soda machine where it was a fountain drink where it was for, free for every single guest. I saw people serving at a completely different level, and I wanted to crawl into a hole because here I am in some messed up jeans and a T-shirt because I didn't want you to even offer me any position because I didn't want it. I was just going through the motions. and But I right. kicked myself because I was like, right when I saw it, I was like, I got to be a part of this. I got to be a part of this. So help me to understand where the mentality of that Disney experience, like, was this parents that raised you this way? Was this aunts and uncles? What, I mean, how did you have that type of visionary mind? Because the Mike Allens of the world don't come along, but uh, once every, you know, once or twice a generation. Yeah, I don't know if it was one thing or another. Uh, you know, my parents probably didn't play a whole lot, although my father, his business was building retail stores. So he, he was a commercial designer and, and built, you know, stores. So as a kid growing up, that's kind of what I did. I swept sawdust and worked in their, their factory and, and helped build retail interiors. So that probably played a little bit to do with it. But my parents were always like, Mike, slow down. You know, you're, you're, you need to get a real job. You need to quit playing. Uh, you know, you're, you're thinking too much. Just you're, you're too inventive. You're crazy. You know, stuff like that. My mom even said, you could never make a, a living as a photographer. So you need to find a real job. <laughs> so <laughs> that was disappointing, but it also set me in motion. It's like, okay, mom, uh, thanks for the advice, but I have some other plans here. And, you know, I, I slowly figured a way to use my creative juices to, to start my first business, the salon business. And I don't know if we said it, the name was Aston Salon uh, back in the day. And it had about 20, 25 year run, did very well. Uh, very, very fun business, but that whole mentality, you know, I love Disney world. I mean, you, you've been Disneyland, I'm sure out in your neck of the woods, yeah. but Disney world, you walk into, you know, the theme park and you're just away about all the, uh, creativity and, and detail, uh, from, you know, Cinderella's castle to just the streets and the whole town, uh, main street, and just all the different exhibits and rides. Epcot Center, the whole nine yards, it, that kind of influenced me because uh, I wanted to come back to Memphis and create that little mini experience that I, the best I could with what little money I had. I mean, literally, speaking of money and Dave Ramsey, when I started the business, I had no money. 
I mean, I started with like $5 in my checking account. Um, I had no cash. Uh, so as, as we were making money, I kind of, you know, just did things as low, as cheap as possible and, and did a lot of physical labor myself. I mean, they were, I built everything by hand. You know, I learned some of that growing up. So I, I just applied that te technology and uh, construction skill to build things. And that saved thousands of dollars. I mean, just probably hundreds of thousands of dollars because I had that talent. But also that drive. I would have done it if I had no talent. Uh, I just wanted to get it built and get it done. And over the years, as we evolved, I was able to afford to, to hire and get good people to do the kind of things I wanted to see done. But yeah, Kelly, it's just back to that vision. And I, I remember when you pulled up in the in the salon uh, that first time, I saw this kid out the window and he had this old looking, what was it, a Bel Air? 63 Impala. 3 Impala. Okay. And I thought, look at that kid with this car out there. What, nobody drives a car like that. It's like grandma's car out there. Who <laughs> could do it? And you still have that car to this day. I followed you and seen what you, you restored it and kept on riding it. It's like, it's the, and that car is probably worth what? 40, 50 grand now? Who knows? <laughs> I don't even know. But it's my, I gave probably it. Probably got it for like 500 bucks. I know. I got it for four, 1400. My dad bought it when I was in 11th grade from the original owner, 86,000 miles on it. And now, yeah. now I, I gave it to my son. So he's only 10, so he doesn't get to drive it yet, but he's, he's got a ways to go. Yeah. yeah I remember you way. pulled up in the parking lot in that old car. And I think later on down the road, I met your father, met your parents uh -huh. and they were so proud of you. Uh, they inspired me. I mean, when, when the, you have an employee's parents come into your business, that was like the greatest compliment to me is having your mom and dad come and say, I mean, Kelly really likes this place. He likes you and we're just proud to have him here. That struck a chord with me as well. So kudos to your, your parents. Well, a thing, a thing that you said to me, and I, I alluded to it earlier, but a thing that you said, and it was in passing, I was going to leave and I was going to move to California. And number one, you were super supportive, hugely supportive. And you were like, you know, go and do what you need to do. And you were just, and then you, you pulled me, you, it was almost like I was walking out of the office and you, you kind of grabbed my arm a little bit and you said, Hey man. Um, and I was, I was 19 years old or 20 years old at the time, maybe 20, 21, somewhere around there. And you said, Hey man, uh, just want to let you know if you ever want to open a, a salon, uh, I would love to do it with you. And it was that quick of a, but that bit of life that you spoke into me at that moment helped me to realize that maybe there was a little bit more value than I was seeing in me. And I want to thank you for that. Um, because Good. it, yeah, it I, I felt that way and still felt that way. You know, it's like I wanted to, you to be successful and anything I could do to help, I would do it. Wow. It's, it's amazing, man. And so let's talk about the transition because I think a lot of times people get their identity wrapped up in something, right? So you did the salon for 25 years, right? And I, I I'm feeling you on this because we did the salon for, we did the salons for 15 years and recently, yeah. uh, you know, in the, uh, about a year ago, we sold all of them and everyone attached my name to you're Kelly, you're the salon owner or you're Kelly, the hairdresser. And for me, we pivoted, shifted completely hundred percent and talk to us about that shift and how I, I think you've done it so gracefully where your identity, Mike has never been wrapped up in anything that you did. You were just Mike Allen, no matter where you were, how were you able to do that? Uh, I don't know if I've actually through that way, but, um, let me think through this for a minute. Uh, you know, having that art artistic uh, drive that I've had, you know, with photography and the design of the buildings that I worked in, uh, I think what drove it too is I, the timing was right. I, I hit photography just on the end of the film days and then it converted into digital, which was kind of a strange transition because most film photographers had no idea of, you know, what digital was, most of them didn't want it. They're like, no, we're going to keep doing film. And there was only, there was a small field of photographers. I kind of got into it with maybe in our town, maybe 50 photographers in Memphis, and five, zero, maybe 25. It was a small amount of photographers in Memphis. And out of those, there was four or five that were really, really good professional photographers that, that had, you know, a good business, but the digital world, uh, I just kind of got into it at the right time. 
and, and I had this, uh, already had a portfolio that the clients had seen over the years. So I was able to use that as the first thing a photographer needed was a website. And I already had, you know, a portfolio and, and photos from years of my work. So that helped me usher in the photography business. And I had a reputation. So I had clients, clients were calling me left and right. The phone was ringing off the hook. Uh, and one of the things I transitioned into from the salon and didn't really mean to, but got big into the wedding industry. And it was a lot like the, the hair salon industry uh, and did a lot of wedding photography. Now, over the years, I've transitioned back out of that because it, you know, it's time consuming. You, you work every weekend. You're literally working 40, 50 hours during the week to edit what you shot over the weekend. So we had, I had no friends I mean, I was working every weekend. So you couldn't go to parties and couldn't go to dinner and go, go do things with friends and family because you're always working. So that part of the photography world is tough, but I, you know, did that for a 15 years straight working every weekend and made a, a good amount of money, made very good money. Flew to Las Vegas every year to study with other photographers at photography conventions and just honed my craft and learned to get better and better and better uh, at my ph photography. Um, still not where I want to be today. I mean, I'm, there's so many photographers I look at just blow me away that I want to be more like them. Uh, but, you know, that's, I guess that's part of the artistic nature in all of us. We always want to keep reinventing ourselves and get better and better at what we do. But that part of my photography world uh, the kind of money that, that I made early on in my career, that's when Dave Ramsey kicked in. That's when I le learned about him and, and started saving money, buying equipment and downsizing. Actually, the salons, we had two, two big salons at one point, 60 employees doing close to four or $5 million a year. Uh, and when you start signing leases and look at your bank accounts and then start thinking Dave Ramsey, what can I do better? I had to almost humble myself and say, do I really want to keep pursuing these big, big businesses or do I want to downsize? And, you know, I took a, just a mathematical equation. I looked at how much money I was making with photography versus how much money I was making in the salon. And the salon was just a big debt cash cow, just sucked all the money away as fast because you had to, you had to invest in it. You had to keep it moving. You had to pay people and you had to pay taxes, a lot of taxes. I mean, we paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes over the years, payroll taxes, city taxes, state taxes, uh, retail taxes, you name it. So I looked at the math and realized I'm making more money as a photographer than I am as a business owner. So uh, my wife's still her dresser day and she's, you know, working in another salon, but she still makes good money. She's very successful. Uh, she gets better. She's like me. She's driven too. She, she never wants to stop and she keeps working, working, working. Uh, but I think in the photography world, I learned that business so well, kind of like the salon business. I just, just immersed myself in it to learn it. And that kept the phone ringing. Uh, you know, I've had phone calls from different agencies across the country. They come into Memphis. They're looking for a photographer. I say, Hey, Mike, can you do this? Can you do that? Will you shoot for us? Will you shoot for this? You know, I've had calls from uh, big, big names like Dirks Bentley and Lauren Elena and more, just different people that are in Memphis and they need a photographer for an event they're doing or for uh, something, you know, Memphis uh, launch. Uh, so I get the phone call to shoot behind the scenes of movies, uh, get picture, you know, pictures for people, you know, for uh, advertising and promoting themselves. So, you know, it's a... Big business, and I, you know, today I, you know, I still work, you know, pretty much nine to five, you know, except seven days a week. I've scaled it back to three or four, so I'm trying to cut back. So, but so, I still enjoy it. So, yeah. So, Mike, uh, a, a thing that hit me when I was in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I tell this story a lot uh, to to my friends, but there was a guy named Cousin Barb, and we were we were shooting pool, and Cousin Barb said to me. Um, What's the most valuable thing that you own? And I listened to him because I knew how successful he was in business. He started off um, installing windows. He was a, a laborer. And at the time, he was actually installing all the glass for um, McDonald's from Portland, Oregon, all the way to the East Coast. So <clears throat> you could imagine how he had grown. Yeah. So I was just listening to him. And he was that wise guy, but we're shooting pool. He says, what's the most valuable thing you own? 
And at the time, I was trying to be puffed up. I had just, you know, bought my second house at the time. I was like, my house. And then he's like, nope. I was like, my car? He's like, nope. And I went to a bunch of different ones. And then he just kept, nope, nope, nope. And then I just listened to him. And he said, the most valuable thing that you ever will own is your name. And at first, I was confused. And I was like, that doesn't make it. And he said, because your name will get you, will open doors for you that all the skill in the world could never, but your name is so very important. You're probably one of the best examples of this, Mike, because listening to you, you developed a name, not as a salon guy, but as a guy who was a visionary and was going to give great service and was going to take care of people. You said before we started recording that what else are we on this life for but to serve, or on this wor- or on this earth for but to serve other people? This is an uncommon thought process, Michael. Where does it come from? How can you stay sharp? And how important has your name been through all of this? Well, um, God, the whole vision of you know serving others is is biblical. I mean, it goes back to thousands of years, back in the days when. Uh, people had to wash each other's feet because they didn't have shoes. They had sandals and they didn't have paved roads and sidewalks. They had to work, walk in the dirt in the sand. Uh, so uh, when, when you came to somebody's village or town, they, they greeted you and out of kindness, they would wash your feet. Uh, so that's, it's kind of something you learn through uh, the Bible uh, and about Jesus. He, he came to earth to serve us. A lot of people get wrapped up in religion and spirituality and religious this and church. It's it's church is is serving one another. Uh, I've got so many friends that I know that they're here serving other people. Uh, that's, that's what they do. That's what they get. They enjoy their life and their jobs. Uh, their business is successful because they learn that principle of serve one another. It also helps you not think about yourself as much. Because sometimes you start thinking about yourself and you hear stories these days of kids committing suicide and uh, just the hate and violence that you hear on the streets. And you realize these people are so thinking so much about themselves because they're just kind of self-absorbed. If they thought more about giving and what they could do to help other people, it would change their lives. They would, it would open up their eyes and they'd realize, I, I gave somebody something and they appreciated it. And it made me feel good, and it made them feel good. And it just to me, it's just a real common, uh, back to old-fashioned biblical principle. Uh, serve one another. Be kind to one another. Uh, I think the world's forgotten about some of those things these days. But being positive is a mindset. Sometimes you wake up in the morning, I'm sure you, you wake up in the morning and go, oh, man, I just want to... I just want to sleep today. I don't feel good. I don't really want to get up and work. I just kind of... I just don't know what I want to do. But then you kick yourself up and go, okay, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go. And as soon as your feet start moving, it's that momentum. You, you, as soon as you start moving around the house and get going and you know, put on your, your work clothes and put on your business face and your, your clothes, whatever you do to, to get in the mood to, to work, um, just that mindset of thinking, okay, I've got to get up and do this. Once you start moving, it becomes you're driven. Then you're like, how fast can I run today? Because I want to get this done because I enjoy it. And it, it's just, I don't know, you, you've been a good example of that. I've seen you in your business, in your world. You, I'm sure you're the kind of person that wakes up in the morning and says, let's go do this. Right? I'm sure your wife tells you that too. She probably sometimes <laughs> tries to slow you down. It's like, oh. but, uh, yeah, you just have to tell your kids, we're going to go do this. It's going to be fine. And just bear with me. And by the end of the day, all the kids, everybody's looking going, Gee, Dad, thanks. That was fun. So, you know, adventure. Yeah. So, Mike, when you talk about drive, you've alluded to drive a, a bunch of times in our conversation here. Um, how can a person develop drive? Uh, well, you have to start back. You know, I mentioned um, the mindset of the Bible. You have to almost have this humbleness and this mind uh, thought of getting on your knees and just humbling yourself before our Creator God. Pray a 30-second prayer and just be committed. Uh, no matter what you're facing that day, get up and do it. You what know, do you just, What do you say? What do you say to a person? Because you know those 
those, that application, you know, a lot of times people say, okay, well, I'll apply that with my wife, right? I'll apply that with my kids. I'll apply that in my relationships. Although, Mike, when I walk into business, I'm going to be a shark. I'm going to be a, a, a pre apex predator. You know what I'm saying? Like, because I'm going and I'm going to kill it. But I watched you be one of the most successful people in, I mean, for me, you were the most successful person I ever got to come close to. But you weren't the shark. You weren't the person that was like, no, we're going to, we're going to be not to, uh, it's not that you're, uh, we're not going to not be smart in business, but you kept those principles even when people weren't watching because I was watching. I was watching you. I was at 19 years old. I was like, how can this dude do this? How can he continue to respect people? How can he continue to be humble? Can you help the people out there to understand how you can take this type of mentality into business where in today's world, people will say, if you walk in humble, then you'll get stepped on and that you'll, that people will take advantage of you. But I noticed with you, you're not fearing that and you've continued no. to grow. Yeah. My approach with that was, uh, you really want to be humble. You want to have a plan and you've got to preach your plan. There are people in your business, people around you, be your family, but you don't want to be two sided. You don't want to have this, this one side of you that you're nice and friendly and you know, your family, you're, you're kind of on the weekend, you, you've let your guard down. You're out there just having a good time, but it comes to Monday, you put this guard up and it's like, and you, you've got to go to work. And if you have a boss, you're like, man, I got, I got to follow the rules. I got to do what the boss wants. I got to impress him. I've got a brown nose, whatever I got to do. But to me in, in my business, I didn't come home from the weekend and go to work Monday and change who I was. I brought the weekend with me. I wanted to go to work and people have, see me as an approachable, kind, uh, fun, loving, sharp businessman. I wanted to know I was serious about business, but I was also serious about being nice, uh, serious about helping people and listening and caring for people. I think a lot of business owners, are, they're, they've got their minds so set on or focused on the money. It's almost a, a, a little bit of greed. I mean, you can't be a millionaire or a billionaire without having a little greed because I guess that's part of the recipe. You've got to save your money. You've got to be a damn Dave Ramsey and really be sharp with your, with your dollars and your income. But I hear so many stories of very successful people that, uh, the people around them, they take care of them. Uh, Rush Limbaugh was a great example. You didn't hear about it, but he took care of his, the people around him, uh, to the tunes of thousands of dollars and, and more given, given people things they needed. Uh, when you hear stories like that from other leaders and you say, well, how do I apply that in my life? Well, you can't be two-sided or two-faced. You have to be the same way that, like if you go to church and you shake everybody's hands and you're, you know, uh, worshiping, you gotta be approachable and people gotta see you as you are, as a, as a fellow human on this earth. Um, I see so many businessmen that come in and they're having a good time on the weekend, but they come to work Monday morning and they turn on this, this presidential face and get all serious. and. Uh, then they become, I don't know, pain in the butt and nobody likes working for them. How many stories have you heard about people that hate their bosses? Uh, so I picked as many books as I could read over the years about how to uh, not be that mean old grump, grumpy old boss, but to be an inspiration to the people around me. Uh, so I don't know if that answered the question or not again, but that's Absolutely. part of it. Absolutely. So, I mean, you've always been a visionary, right? And so when I was talking about it and, I mean, it blows my mind to this day when I tell people about in 1995 to have touchscreen computers, right? I mean, just that in itself, because it was not, that was not normal. Um, the things that you did, talk to us about the, the photography industry right now, because you were a pioneer. You're constantly a visionary. You're going out and you're testing things. You were... When I said about social media, some of the people out there listening, because our audience, uh, Mike, is, um, is 25, 25, 25, all the way from, um, was, uh, there's four 25% from 17 years old to almost 70 years old. 
all the demographics are 25%. So we hit almost every person on this earth as far as, you know, their, their age bracket. But there's yep. a, a large amount of them that have never lived without social media. And it's, it's for you, you were a pioneer and a visionary when taking a picture of your stuff and posting it, which is so normal today. Like it didn't happen unless you put it on some sort of social media today. But at the time, you were doing things. You were taking pictures and putting them in Inspire Magazine. You were putting them in L. You were putting them in Town & Country, putting them in all these things. What is that visionary, that thing that people think that you're crazy? Because people thought you were crazy at the time for doing all the things you're doing. What is that now for your photography business that you're starting to do that not many people have caught on yet? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, probably one of the things uh, that I've helped is help on other small businesses, I guess, with photography and trying to teach them uh, just a, a regular iPhone photo really is just a snapshot. It's not really a great picture. It's just something that somebody snapped. Photography, professional photography is, is a whole nother mindset. There's a lot of work that goes into a photo. And I start, I've worked with some several photographers over the years uh, from different cities and different states. And some I actually worked for, for weekends. They come into town and I'd, I'd worked uh, for other professional photographers and I watched and learned what they were doing. And they had the best cameras, the best equipment, put a lot of time into lighting, a lot of thought into what the background was gonna look like behind them. Uh, they weren't just snapping a picture. And when they did take pictures, they would shoot, and it's pretty typical in an editorial or fashion shoot, you'll shoot thousands of photos to get three or four final photos. And a lot of photographers just shoot four or five on their little camera and go, okay, here, here I've got you four or five photos or even 100 photos. But they're, they're all just kind of mediocre and there's not a lot of thought put into it. Uh, you know, a professional photographer is going to have sift through thousands and find the very, very best cream of the crop. And once he's got those, uh, a good photographer then takes that into Photoshop, which is a digital realm. You have to learn to manipulate and manage your photos and enhance them. Uh, you know, this morning before I got on, on the phone with you, I was upstairs editing grass into a, a landscape shot for a, a, a client because the, the property that they were trying to show to a client, uh, there was no grass growing in part of the scene. It was just bare dirt. And I said, look, let me put some grass on that for you so your clients will, will be comfortable and be somewhat impressed that you took the different or took the time to, to make that image the best it could possibly be. And that's kind of my mindset with photography is I take every image I shoot and look at it and go, what else can I do besides take the picture to make it look even better? Uh, brighten it, change the color, repair things, add grass to a scene. Uh, just, you know, Photoshop the heck out of it in some cases, but, but not to the point where it looks fake, but that it just looks, you know, looks very nice. Uh, so I guess in the, in, in the photography world, especially with all, like you said, the, was it 25, 25 or 30, 30, 30, the, the ratio of different ages that you have, uh -huh. a lot of the kids these days pick up the camera and say, I want to be a photographer and they've got a good eye. Many of them do. Uh, but they don't always know what to do with that photo to take it to the next level. It might just be a few tiny little tweaks to take that and, and turn it into an award-winning you know, photo that they can be proud of. So, so, Mike, what would those, like, if you were to give, and I know, like, in today's society, everyone wants to throw things in the microwave, right? So they want to throw things in the microwave, throw it in for two minutes, turn it over or let it chill and then bang, you have, you know, you win a Grammy or you win the Super Bowl or you win whatever, right? Yeah. And what would be three actionable items that a, a new photographer, if they just did the this tweak, that tweak, and this tweak, they would start to see things from a different realm and get a different result? Yeah, I think uh, looking at the best quality camera that they can, they can get, then they probably can't afford it because really good quality cameras cost, you know, five, ten thousand dollars It's not your $300 camera down at Costco. It's a very expensive camera. Uh, so looking at that camera and why there, there's a big difference between the $300 camera and the $5,000 camera. And once they learn the difference, 
it'll change their quality of, of work. Uh, the other thing would be the lens they choose. Uh, like the lenses on this little computer here we're using, you can see on your screen, you've got it's nice and brightly lit, even lit on my little screen. It's kind of average iPhone looking little uh, image there. Uh, so I think um, the biggest thing that photographers need to learn is to notice those differences. Sometimes they just take the picture and they never even notice the difference between you know, screen left and screen right, or this photo and that photo. So I think that's important for them just to, to watch and learn from others and be humble enough. Because just like hairstylists, photographers have big egos too. <laughs> you, you remember all the egos in the, in the salon world? Never, the never. Way. Yeah, never, never. So if, it, you know, if photographers need to kind of humble themselves too and say, what can I do with this photo that I just took to make it even better? And it might be nothing, but it may be, you know, changing the crop a little bit, maybe uh, brightening uh, the background, it may be adding a piece of grass somewhere in, in the landscape, uh, maybe photoshopping a model's lips to where they're a little redder, uh, maybe adjusting the dress in the photo because it didn't quite fit the model right, so you want to tuck and squeeze and do some things that, to make it look as very, very best. A lot of photographers just don't take the time, like, like you said, as a microwave. They just pop it in, pop it out, and, and go to the next thing. And clients will notice that, and that's how I've been successful in the commercial photography world. When a client comes to Memphis and they need a good photographer, they, you know, they, they get on the internet and they find my website because it's, I've worked to get up on the top pages of Google. Uh, but when they see my website, they compare me with you know, four or five other photographers. And they always come back to me and say, your portfolio stands out among everyone we've seen. We want to hire you. So that's because of my portfolio images, I've, I've worked and found the very best and tweaked those and made them look the best they could possibly be because that's my social media. When they see my photo, that one photo has got to draw them in to make, make them want to call my phone number or to send me an email. So, Mike... My dad used to, um, I, I call him my pops, so anyone out there listening, um, you know, or if you follow me on social media, my, my pop used to say something um, all the time to me. He used to say, stop chasing rabbits. And because uh, I would call him with a new idea and I'd be like, pop, we got to go. We got to do this thing. He'd be like, don't chase rabbits. Don't chase rabbits. And what I realized is that he was telling me to slow down to speed up. Slow down your process, slow down your life, slow down your heart, slow down your mind. And then one, one bit of energy could, could take you further than all of the busyness in the world. And when I, yeah. the reason why I say this is because you, to me, are that example of not chasing rabbits. Like you have slowed down, like you've always been in this place so that it always seemed, and it's evident to me now, I understand, I can orate it now, I couldn't put my finger on it back in the day, but you have slowed down and chose mastery as opposed to speeding up and just being, just, just being in the business. Yeah. Has this been conscious? Because this is from, as long as I've known you, and I've known you almost 30 years and I see the exact same thing. And, and if you're listening to Mike right now, you hear it in his voice. If you see him, you see him very calm, collected. He's got his thoughts. He's working through. And it's not like he feels like he's going to miss the bus. In, in, in this age that is like, if you ain't posting, you ain't moving. If you ain't doing, you got to be hustling and grinding. You got to be up and blah, 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 blah. And then, there, then there's. First, it's all about posting. Yeah. And then there's Mike Allen that says, I'm going to be Mike Allen. I'm going to be calm. My goatee is always going to look smooth because it's looked smooth since 1997. And people are going to call. The right people are going to call. How do you stay in that mindset? How can, how can a person out there that's listening, how can they slow themselves down so they can speed up the way that you have? Oh, yeah, that's, that's some good thoughts there, Kelly. And you put that in a book. That's good. <laughs> now, part of it is you just, you have to realize if, if you work yourself too hard, you're going to work yourself to death. So you've got to have this, this spiritual you know, mentality in your mind that I'm going to eat, eat well, uh, 
exercise somewhat. I'm not a big exercise guru, but I, I do stay on my feet all day long and work. Um, but I think you have to have a mindset too, that you're going to, you're going to remain calm. Um, and there's days where I'm, I'm a spaz and I yell and scream and just do stupid stuff. But then, you know, I come back down to earth and go, okay, that didn't accomplish anything. It just, you know, made me stress out. And it's like, just need to take a breath. I'm a, it's like living yoga every day of your life. And I don't do yoga very often, but you know, the, the point of breathing, uh, take a moment to breathe, uh, enjoy the air. Uh, and as a photographer, uh, maybe speak, like you said, I take the time to look at my photos and other people's photos. I mean, that's why I enjoy, you know, Instagram and Pinterest. I, I just like looking at everybody else's photos, see what they're doing. And when I take the time to see what they're doing, then that inspires me. So if I ever hit a writer's block or an artist, you know, sometimes you hit a block and you just can't get creative. I look to other people's work and go, okay, uh, well, no, no, maybe I don't like that work or maybe no, that's not what I want to do. But if, you, if you're patient, it's like, I guess that's part of it too. And being patient, uh, it's, it's like, it'll come to you. You just have to be patient and quiet and, and, uh, kind of do some, not really soul searching, but universe searching, like looking out the window and looking at the sky and, and trying to figure out, okay, why is that cloud so pretty today and yesterday I didn't even notice it. Uh, so taking the time to, to look at the world around you is, is very important. It helps you slow down because uh, the sky is big. You look up in that sky and big majestic clouds and big mountains in the background and uh, big oceans and big horizons and the beauty of the planet it just helps you go wow where are these little i don't know how we got to this planet uh it sounds like god made the planet and the bible tells us he did it's still hard to even comprehend that and when you look at the entire universe you go how did a god create me in this and the entire universe that slows you down too because then you start contemplating okay well if there's all this was made you know, in the image of god this guy must be pretty sharp and I want to get to know him. And that helps you too. You almost breathe in God's spirit. Uh, and that's to me, people talk about spirituality and going to church and you live and breathe church every day. I heard, I heard, I heard a story, I guess a while back, I forgot where I heard it. Uh, but there was a guy that kind of a joke, but he's, you know, people saying, why don't you go to church and, and why don't you, you know, go to church every Sunday and why don't you do this and why don't you do that? And he said, you know, uh, I read the Bible and I, it lives in me and I carry it with me every day. So I don't have to go to church every day because I am in church every day in my own mind. And, and you get that spirit. It's, 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 you become the spiritual guru in your own mind. Uh, nobody else can see that and it sounds crazy, but you just have to kind of really think, okay, why am I here? What has God got planned for me? What talents has he given me that I can use? He didn't give me the talents of, of the other people have, like your brother is an attorney. I don't have that talent, but he gave me eyes and he gave me a vision. And so that's what I try to achieve is, you know, what does God want me to do? And sometimes I wake up and, uh, and then one like you said, run in circles and do me and other things and get too many irons in the fire. And people say, what are you doing? You're doing too much. Sometimes you just have to slow down and, and just focus on those, those two or three things that you do well the things that you enjoy doing and the things you're good at. And if you're not good at it, you might want to change careers, you know? <laughs> so, so Mike, I, you were talking about the uh, fact that, you know, that God made everything in his image. And a lot of times he makes things and then we use them for another purpose. And that when, when we use it for another purpose, it doesn't work out. Right. And so something that could be made for the best purpose. Say like, uh, I was, I was talking with one of my friends the other day and he worked in the, uh, facial recognition space and technology. And this can be amazing stuff. It can, we can open our iPhones with it. We can, you know, uh, we could do all day. I mean, amazing, amazing things, but he got, he saw the dark side of it. He saw the dark side of that facial recognition, meaning that there was companies that were, you know, when you were walking into a store, they were recognizing your face and then placing you and selling your data and doing all this stuff. Now, I don't believe that it was inherently that was a bad thing, but it was used for the bad. 
The reason why I'm saying this is because something that you just said, I believe that everybody's talents and uniqueness was built to inspire us, which you said. But there's a thing that's going on in today's society, and especially, especially with all of the information that we have going out, that it turns from inspiration into comparison. And I've never... Never in all of our years that I've known you, I've never seen you, you like I've never seen that switch. How are you able to make that such a defined line? Because some people look at pictures and they're inspired by them. And then they're inspired by them so much that they're like, well, why don't I have it? And then they compare their life and that's where it goes wrong. Yeah. Right. So how, how are you able to keep those so separate and how have you been able to do it over the years? Well, you have to be on a, on a mission obviously to, to see um, what you're on this earth for, I mean, why you're here. Uh, so part of that is what you can try to compare yourself to others and do what they do. But at the end of the day, they, they may be across the pond or across the, another island somewhere or another country. Um, so it's hard to compare somebody right to your face. Uh, and I, I think people need to just kind of have some quiet time and, and compare themselves to to God and realize we're, we're just little tiny ants next to him. So it humbles you, but also makes you realize, okay, dial it back. Uh, it's not about me. It's about, you know, what I can do to help others. I mean, God put us all here and we can either fight and struggle and be mean to each other, or we can love one another. Uh, and then when you do that, you quit comparing and then you become more serving uh, and helping and it kind of, it, it just, again, a comparison, you become very selfish and you start, I want to be like this. I'm going to do this. I don't want to copy this. I don't want to be like that. But if you've let go of trying to be, you know, I'm not as good as so-and-so, or I can't do this, or I can't be like so-and-so, or I, I didn't make, you know, as much money as this, as my coworker made, or as my you know, friend down the street made, uh, it just helps, helps you slow down a little bit just to realize you're here for a purpose. And you got to figure out what that purpose is. Well, Mike, the whole reason why I started the podcast is because of my kids, right? And I want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, man, like you inspired me and gave me a foundation. You took a chance on a kid when I was 19 years old and you breathed life into so many aspects of my life that I didn't even know at the time you were planting so many seeds. It inspired me so much that when I built my businesses, um, when I did, I built my businesses based off the foundation that you gave me and the, the, the example that you gave me, not through you sitting me down and telling me the lessons and this is what, but just watching you, watching the way that you interacted with your family, the way that you interacted with your wife, the way that you interacted with people. And even when sometimes, and I saw them at times, uh, people be nasty with you, but you still just stayed Mike Allen all the time. And I created the podcast for, for the kids because I wanted to take iconic people like yourself. And you're probably one of the most iconic people to me in my entire life. And I said that at the beginning of the podcast. Hopefully I said it in the middle and I'll say it right now. Because very, very few people, people affect people, but very, very few people impact people. You made me want to be a better business owner, a better man, a better dad, a better father, you know, a, a better husband, a better friend, a better brother. And you impacted every single aspect of my family from my parents on down the line to my brother, um, helping him to see uh, business from a different side. Hell, you even housed him at one point. <laughs> and I wanted to take iconic people like yourself and I wanted to show my kids that it wasn't uh, the Mike Allens of the world weren't superheroes, that they simply had a phenomenal attitude and crazy work ethic. So what advice would you give to Maddox and McKenna? And if you could use both their names, it would be awesome. McKenna, yeah. Maddox and McKenna, I think uh, something that you need to do is, uh, uh, what's the right word for it? Um, look at your parents, listen to what they have to say. Also, think about what you can do to help them. Uh, the whole reason we are parents is because we wanted, we wanted to have children. We wanted to have uh, an extension of ourselves that we could see grow and, and blossom. Uh, it's just a blessing for us to be able to have kids. And 
when we nurture our children, um, it helps them become nurturing. So it's like if, if I help them, they'll see me as a dad helping them tie their shoe. Well, then they'll learn as a model that, that you gave them as your father to tie other people's shoes, uh, to help them out, to help other people. Uh, the biggest blessing, I think, is having children. You know, I've got kids. Uh, my son, uh, I'm very proud of. Um, I guess he probably saw some similar things that you see in me. Uh, we really haven't talked in a whole lot of detail, but we've had one or two conversations over the years. Um, he's an artist like myself. He's a visionary. In fact, he's probably more of a visionary than I am, uh, which, you know, it's hard to believe, but he wanted to be a, a, a graphic artist. That was his mindset. Dad, I'm going to be a graphic artist. I'm going to go to work. Uh, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to go to work, you know, for Apple and blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, sure, kid. You know, he's a little kid uh, in high school in Memphis. I'm going, he'll never get off the couch. I don't know what's, you know, I don't know what to do. But all I do is pray. I got on my knees and prayed for him all the time, all my kids. Uh, but to this day, he went to art college. Uh, he impressed his teacher so much that they helped him get a job at Apple. Apple hired him, sent him to New York. Uh, in New York, uh, he worked for a couple of other startup companies in a very short period of time as well because they saw his talent. And then Google hired him. Google moved him to San Francisco where he's been working for several years. Uh, now he's in Denver in the Google office in Denver, was just back in San Francisco yesterday working in the office. Uh, so his talent, Google hired him because they, they liked his talent a lot of computer engineers are very technical and everything's numbers and square blocks and blah, blah, blah. Where my son Ryan uh, sees things, you know, through a different lens uh, as an artist. And he sees colors and shapes and movement. And he knows what attracts people to want to purchase something or to look at something. Uh, the same way with my oldest daughter, uh, proud as I can be of her. She just uh, recently had two children in the last couple of years which, uh, and my son had two kids too. So I went from zero grandkids about three years ago to four grandkids. All of a sudden I'm a grandfather and that's been a lot. I'm, I'm failing, I think at that, but I'm trying. Yeah. You know, I guess I'll learn how to do it. Uh, but my daughter Morgan has been very successful. She ended up being an interior designer, interior decorator, and has this amazing talent to take a space with little budget or little, product or little anything and transform it into this uh, amazing home that you'd see on HGTV. Uh, people you know, call her to help them. She just walks in with a, this you know, brown box full of stuff. Maybe it's from Target or Walmart or wherever she, she can find it on the side of the road sometimes and transforms things. And it's just amazing the talent she has. And then my youngest daughter, which uh, she just recently, I guess, uh, started college. The pandemic slowed her down, so she, she was going to take a gap year. I don't think a lot of kids were like, oh, man, I'm going to take a gap year right because I'm just tired of school. She took a gap year, then COVID hit the year after her gap year. So she got a two-year gap year, uh, but she started college last semester online. And, you know, she didn't want my help other than I had to help her get a computer and, you know, get her in the right direction because she's very smart. She doesn't really need me. At least that's what she says. And I'm kind of glad. But all that last two weeks ago, she got a report card or what do they call it in college? Your exam scores. And the top of the, the sheet said Dean's list. And man, my heart just caved in. It's like, wow, my, my daughter just made Dean's list first year in college. And she's, you know, she's like me. She's very quiet. In fact, she walked down the stairs a while ago and turned around and walked away. She didn't want the computer to think there was somebody that, that she was in the house. You know, she's just scared to death of people. Uh, but she's smart and sharp as tack and hopefully learned a few things from watching her old dad uh, as far as our whole creative process. I guess we have these genes in our body. Everybody has different genes of what they would want to do in life. And, uh, my gene has been creativity and artistry and just being kind, just try to be kind to people.
uh, all this road rage stuff, people need to pull over and just take a chill pill. You know, <laughs> they need to be kind. That's what's important. Well, Mike, it has been an absolute pleasure. I mean, to to be able to spend time with you, and not only uh, you know, not only today, but I, I want to make sure that we get you back on the podcast too, because I think there's so many photographers out there too um, that would love to you know continue to hear the inside working. But I, I love the fact that you always bring it back to the kindness, man. You always bring it back to that it's not about you, that it's about everybody else. And when you're serving people, you won't have to worry about. You know, because in today's society, and I, it's so refreshing to hear you because in today's society, you hear always about take care of number one. You've got to you've got to take care of this. No one else will. And it's like I've seen another side through my mentors, which is you through my pops, where they were co- where you guys are constantly making sure that everybody else is taken care of. And then you never really had to worry about all the rest of this stuff because what most people call magic or out of the blue, you know where it came from. You knew that, that by serving from the example that you've had in, in your life with the Lord, that God is going to take care of you. But yeah. you were given, you were blessed to be a blessing and to continue to pour out onto other people. And I just, I cannot thank you enough, man, for what you've done in my life. Um, my kids, my kids haven't got a chance to meet you, but they enjoy a life because of you, man. I had a wow. business because of you. Yep. I got to travel the world because of you. I have a, 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 a you know, when, when the pandemic hit and we shifted and, and I have though that type of strength in a large part because of you, Mike Allen. And I want to thank you so much for it, man. You. Yeah. I think it's God. He's, you know, he, he just, he's worked together to knit us together in a fine <laughs> spider web that we have between us to keep us connected over these years. So. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm so thankful for you, man. And uh, now's the time. If you're out there listening, you're watching, uh, check out the sponsors. They're running across the ticker. If you're watching, um, they're in the, the, the bio. Also, you can click the links and check them out. Um, make sure that you do that. Share it with uh, every single friend. If you got a photographer friend out there, you got a, a salon owner friend out there, you got a, a entrepreneur, a father, a dad, share this episode with anybody that you can, because I think the more and more that uh, Mike Allen that we have in the world, I believe that the better and better this world will be. And uh, Mike, I want to thank you again for being on the show. And I can't wait to have you on again. Um, you are an absolute, absolute joy. Uh, and just a phenomenal example. My mom said it, and I said it in my men's group this morning that um, my mom used to always say to me, sometimes you need Jesus with skin, meaning that you need to have people who exemplify what Jesus is in your life, and you're one of those people, man. And I want to thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank you, man. It's been an honor to to watch you grow and blossom over the years and uh, see you get married and have kids. And it's just, uh, it's just a, a blessing to me, just a joy to, to see that happen. Well, Mike, you're, you're officially off the hot seat. Bye.